Help support AMTV by becoming a patron, an AMTV staff member, and following us over on Twitter. If there's one thing most people can get behind, it's the idea of a fun, harmless prank. In the realm of television, the old April Fools has been carried out numerous times by different broadcasters across the world. We took a look at how Sweden was able to trick many viewers into believing that Colour TV was only a nylon stocking away, all the way back in 1962, several years before any major European territory started up a colour service. We've also touched on the BBC, which in its 100 year history has also been up for a little joke here and there. But what happens when a joke is told with the utmost sincerity from a broadcaster with the reputation of the Beeb? Surely they'd face no backlash once all is revealed, right? The British Broadcasting Company started up in 1922, before becoming the British Broadcasting Corporation a few years later. Initially being a trailblazer in the booming world of radio, the prospect of television became a new focus during the mid to late 1930s. On the 2nd of November, 1936, the BBC television service was officially launched, becoming one of the first in the world and certainly the first to broadcast in high definition. Look, I know it sounds daft, but back in 1936, 405 lines was certainly considered to be high def. After suspending transmissions during World War II, the fledgling service was restarted in 1946, and by the time of Queen Elizabeth II's coronation in 1953, a television set rapidly became one of the most common items that you'd see within the family living room. As they became more affordable and programming hours increased, this once unknown technology was fast becoming part of the furniture, a small screen companion to the cinemas that so many love to go and indulge in. But any successful television service is bolstered by the very programmes it chooses to broadcast. On the 11th of November, 1953, a new current affairs show transmitted for the first time, Panorama. Its focus on investigative journalism and covering topics that were in the news helped it carve out a strong audience, especially for 1950s TV. It wasn't afraid to push boundaries, something that was avoided to some extent in the still young industry, for fear that the viewer base would turn away from the medium should any programme go what would be considered too far. However, it wasn't always doom and gloom. In the early days of Panorama, various art features and other such segments were shown as part of the programme. On the edition broadcast on the 1st of April 1957, the millions watching would be in for a shock. At this time in Panorama's life, the show was being produced by Michael Peacock. Peacock was a rising star in the television world, having reached the position of producer and editor at just 26 years old. Upon joining Panorama in 1955, with Richard Dimbleby as the regular presenter, they would help elevate the programme to essential viewing status amongst the British public. One key moment would come in 1956, when the Suez Canal crisis began. The coverage via Panorama attracted well over 10 million viewers, which for a growing industry as television was back then, is quite an incredible result. It seems, however, that Michael had a jovial side to him too as a producer, when one of his cameramen suggested an idea that would go on to be one of the BBC's most famous hoaxes. Charles de Jaeger was a BBC cameraman, first gaining the position in 1948, but a memory from his upbringing would inspire something equally memorable in TV history. Born in Vienna, the capital of Austria, Charles would first join the BBC in 1943 during World War II, and recognising the work he'd already done overseas, he would often be sent out by the Beeb on international projects, also due to the fact he was fluent in English, French, Italian and German. He would come to gain a reputation for being a bit of a practical joker. One such example was when he was sent off to Italy to helm an interview with the Pope. When told that His Holiness will see you on Tuesday afternoon, Charles apparently replied with, yes, but is he a man of his word? Risky business to say something like that in the Vatican but it would be a childhood memory that would spark the story that you're here for today. Charles recounted that in school, one of his teachers had said to him and his friends, Boys, you are so stupid, you'd believe me if I told you that spaghetti grew on trees. From this memory, Charles took the idea to one of Panorama's writers, David Wheeler, and plotted out a potential segment. Then the idea had to pass through Michael Peacock, as the main producer and editor. If he wasn't on board, then there was no way it was going to make it to air. Fortunately, Peacock was all for the idea, and gave Charles a £100 budget and sent him on his way to film the short vignette. Keep in mind, £100 back in 1957 is nearly £2,000 today, so this was no chump change. Charles travelled to Switzerland in March, specifically the small village of Castagnola, found on the northern shore of Lake Lugano. 
Once there, a silent film was shot, of a Swiss family collecting a bumper harvest after a mild winter. What they had been seemingly harvesting, however, was the rather unconventional choice of spaghetti. At 8.30pm on Monday the 1st of April, that night's panorama began. Items for the day's docket included a piece on the leader of the Greek Cypriots, and then Prince Philip attending the premiere of a new war movie, The Yangtze Incident. After a wine tasting contest, viewers were transported over to Switzerland. With lush landscapes presented, it would have been enough to wow anyone watching in 1957, a time when travel to Europe, and indeed the culture of Europe, wasn't as easily accessible as it is now. Richard Dimbleby's voice narrated the silent film, his ever-present professional demeanour delivered with the utmost clarity, gave the footage the same level of importance and attention as any other item that he delivered for Panorama. The spaghetti trees, when you see them, may look entirely laughable, but keep in mind, back in 1957, spaghetti wasn't as commonplace in the UK. It was known for being an exotic Italian dish, with many Italian cuisines yet to explode in popularity amongst the eager Brits. So even though it's likely that Charles and his team just lobbed a bunch of spaghetti over some perfectly good trees, the resulting effect could have been viewed as quite plausible for a 1957 viewer. The accompanying narration from Richard Dimbleby would have further cemented this belief and the intrigue in the entire prospect. There's always the chance of a late frost, which, while not entirely ruining the crop, generally impairs the flavour and makes it difficult for him to obtain top prices in world markets. Talks of a late frost potentially damaging the flavour, the Swiss harvesting spaghetti family by family, and the virtual disappearance of the spaghetti weevil. This one I find particularly humorous, as there is no picture or footage shown of such weevil, making their virtual disappearance all the more funnier when you cotton on to the joke. Another reason why this may be a bumper year lies in the virtual disappearance of the spaghetti weevil, the tiny creature whose depredations have caused much concern in the past. After concluding to viewers that there is nothing quite like homegrown spaghetti, straight from your garden no less, the segment ends, and that's where the floodgates opened. It's all too easy to forget that back in 1957, British TV viewers had a choice of just two channels, the BBC television service and independent television, with different companies being responsible for different regions. The ITV network by this time hadn't quite reached its full capacity. By April the 1st, the only companies operating on behalf of ITV were Granada, ABC, ATV, and Associated Rediffusion. So there were still great swaths of the UK, including Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, who did not yet have consistent access to the other side. Barb records show that as of January 1957, there were roughly 15.8 million domestic homes across the country. Of those, roughly 7 million, about 44%, had a TV receiver. Of that 44%, only 2.7 million had access to an ITV service, meaning that the BBC typically had a bigger audience to draw upon in the late 50s. And with those millions of eyes watching, many of them seeing Switzerland and perhaps even spaghetti for the first time, there were bound to be questions. Several wrote into the Beeb, asking how they themselves could make and grow their own spaghetti right in the back garden. Reportedly, replies from the BBC read something like this. Place a sprig of spaghetti in a tin of tomato sauce and hope for the best tongue ever so firmly in cheek, no? But these letters from intrigued audience members were perhaps the best outcome the BBC could have hoped for. What they didn't expect, perhaps, though, was the backlash. Some people say that the British have a great sense of humour. Others say our humour is filled with nothing but sarcasm and is actually devoid of anything genuinely funny. When regarding the Spaghetti Tree segment on Panorama, it seems a fair chunk of the viewers exhibited the latter. For as many letters that came in expressing interest in how to grow their own spaghetti, equal amounts came in expressing disgust and shock that such a trusted organisation like the BBC would go to such lengths to purport false information to their viewers, and in some cases, start family arguments, with reports claiming, The husband knew it must be true that spaghetti grew on a bush because Richard Dimbleby had said so, and the wife knew it was made with flour and water, but neither could convince the other. Granted, there was no disclaimer at the end of Panorama to inform the audience that they had essentially been pranked. However, the final line delivered to camera by Richard Dimbleby was this. Now we say goodnight, on this first day of April. With particular emphasis placed on the last part of the phrase. Regardless, if people picked up on that or not, I'd argue there is nothing genuinely harmful about the film. Some may even say these days that this is an example of fake news. I mean, yeah, the information in this is pretty fake, but it's not concerning events of national importance or anything like that. It's literally talking about growing spaghetti on trees. Spaghetti on trees. 
And even if many millions back in 1957 may not have been familiar with the food in question, you can't tell me that believing this false information is somehow going to have a major negative impact on your life. Regardless on where viewers placed on this piece, it wouldn't stop the story of the spaghetti trees becoming known as one of the most famous and most renowned April Fool's jokes in television history. Before the television service closed down for the evening, the BBC reportedly put out a statement regarding the spaghetti trees. Before I show you this, I did find this on hoaxes.org, which has details on, well, hoaxes. I haven't been able to find this statement anywhere else, and obviously I wasn't around back in 1957, and as far as I know, we don't have any surviving footage. So take this one with a pinch of salt. The statement supposedly read as follows. The BBC has received a mixed reaction to a spoof documentary broadcast this evening about spaghetti crops in Switzerland. The hoax panorama programme, narrated by distinguished broadcaster Richard Dimbleby, featured a family in Ticino, in Switzerland, carrying out their annual spaghetti harvest. It showed women carefully plucking strands of spaghetti from a tree and laying them in the sun to dry. But some viewers failed to see the funny side of the broadcast and criticised the BBC for airing the item on what is supposed to be a serious factual programme. Others, however, were so intrigued they wanted to find out where they could purchase their very own spaghetti bush. Spaghetti is not a widely eaten food in the UK and is considered by many as an exotic delicacy. Mr Dimbleby explained how each year, the end of March, is a very anxious time for spaghetti harvesters all over Europe as severe frost can impair the flavour of the spaghetti. He also explained how each strand of spaghetti always grows to the same length thanks to years of hard work by generations of growers. This is believed to be one of the first times the medium of television has been used to stage an April Fool's Day hoax. If this statement was delivered on close down, it didn't have much impact in fending off the press. Papers had a field day with the hoax, many with headlines claiming that the BBC had led viewers astray with their broadcast. Apparently one of the people fooled was Sir Ian Jacob. Who is that you ask? Only the then Director General of the BBC itself. Having not received a note informing him of the hoax broadcast, Jacob saw the item at home with all the other millions. Curious at the information, he attempted to consult his copy of Encyclopedia Britannica for answers. This is what you'd do before the internet, kids. Now, fooling your big boss at work could spell disaster for anyone involved, so it perhaps surprised Charles de Jaeger, the humble cameraman behind the idea, when he received a note from the DG saying, The spaghetti harvest was a splendid idea, beautifully shot and organised. This item has caused a great deal of delight one way and another. Thank you very much indeed. Despite all being in on the biggest prank in television yet, the major players would all go on to further success in their careers. Producer and editor Michael Peacock would be the first controller of BBC Two, which launched in 1964. Shortly after, he would be moved to be the controller of the flagship channel, then renamed to BBC One. He was the first managing director for London Weekend Television and eventually moved to the United States to become the executive vice president of Warner Brothers TV. That same year, he had helped form Manchester's Piccadilly Radio, for which he would remain a director until 1987. He also was a founding member of Video Arts, a firm that specialised in producing training films, which ultimately became the leader in its field, distributing their training films all across the world. Richard Dimbleby continued his successful career working for the BBC, being the reassuring voice the nation needed at several key moments, such as general elections or the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962 and the funeral of Winston Churchill in January of 1965. By the end of the year in December, Richard would sadly pass away himself at just 52, due to testicular cancer. His legacy lives on, being helmed as one of the first great television journalists and presenters, and of course in his son, David Dimbleby, who would follow in his father's footsteps into becoming one of Britain's most respected journalists and broadcasters. Panorama, the programme, would continue to thrive throughout the following decades. As of the making of this video, the show still continues to broadcast frequently, this year being its 70th anniversary. Charles de Jaeger, the cameraman who helped inspire this humorous hoax, would leave the BBC in 1959 to work more as a freelancer. He would pass away in the May of 2000 at the age of 89. Without his memory of being a schoolboy, chastised by his teacher, we may have never been treated to this little segment. Which by today's April Fool standards is entirely harmless, but there's a reason why it is still talked about and still up there as one of the best in the television medium. It showed that the BBC had a softer side, one that could veer away from the stiff upper lip impression some viewers got from the corporation. The professional delivery from Dimbleby, combined with the beautiful location work done in Switzerland, really sell the idea that these strands of spaghetti 
could really be grown on the trees in your back garden. At a time when few Brits had seldom seen spaghetti, never mind tasted it, it was able to fool the nation in a harmless, yet timelessly charming manner. The full clip is on the BBC Archive channel if you want to see it for yourself, and I highly recommend that you do, so you yourself can experience the BBC's first, and perhaps best remembered, April Fool's hoax.